all me? Yeah. Cheers, Guy. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see you all. I mean, I, uh, I, I was going to say, um, in uh, response to the, the my, my essay title, my discussion title, the, the uh, evening's uh, talk is, is the centre ground a myth? What a great question and title it is. And thank you very much for choosing it. And then I realised my office picked it. Uh, not you guys, uh, which makes me think they're spending too much time chin stroking and not enough time campaigning. Um, but what I love about the title, Is the Centre Ground a Myth, um, is that it implies glamour and mystery. Uh, as if, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the centre ground being in the same uh, arena as, you know, Atlantis or El Dorado or Planet Vulcan, when we're actually talking about Stephen Kinnock, Vince Cable and Nicky Morgan. And um, I, uh, I, I have met all three of them and I can vouch for the fact that they are real and not mythological in any way, shape or form. Um, but the centre ground, how boring. How very, very boring. I joined the Liberals as a 16 year old uh, because I'm a Liberal, because I was an awkward kid who was passionate about politics and didn't want to conform to the tedious sheep like predictability of joining the Labour Party or the Conservative Party. No offence, but I thought that any old mediocrity could become a Labour or Tory MP. What's the point? in that. It's like winning the Premier League with Man United or Chelsea or these days Man City. It's expected. It's not interesting. Winning the league with Leicester City or going back in time, Blackburn Rovers or Nottingham Forest, that's interesting. That's worth doing. So being a Liberal, even becoming a Liberal MP, that's interesting. It's quirky. It's worth doing. Well, that's how my 16 year old head worked. Uh, I had joined an edgy, radical liberal party. Call me a centrist and I'd have given you a very, very hard stare. Today, nearly 48 years of age with four children, I look myself in the mirror and I come to the realisation that I am, in pretty much every sense, a centrist dad. And folks, <laughs> I am cool with that. I am cool with that. So, of course, the Liberal Democrats are occupants of part of the political centre, depending on how you define it, of course. So what is the centre ground? Is it a myth? And even if it isn't a myth, does it even matter? So the defining characteristics of those inhabitants of the centre ground would be, perhaps, that they are idealistic, but not dogmatic. That they accept what we used to refer to as the concept of the mixed economy, a regulated market economy, but with state ownership of key cornerstone services and infrastructure, redistributive taxation and an enterprise culture. Pragmatic, seeking in all areas to compromise with others because of an instinctive belief that no one movement or person or party has a monopoly on good ideas or indeed on bad ideas and that compromising should extend not just beyond, or not just across political parties and the UK, but internationally also. So it's hard to see how a resident of the centre ground would be against us being in the EU or NATO, for instance. Now there are complications and camps within the centre ground, not just partisan divisions, but instinctive and ideological. For example, in the UK, Liberals tend to be social democrats but most many social democrats are not liberals and i pray in aid uh messrs blunkett straw and blair id cards detention without trial and a hostile environment towards immigrants under the new labor government from 97 to 2010 those folks were clearly social democrats and not all that liberal so there is a great temptation for all of us with a political creed to make it sound more glorious and precise uh, than it really is. That one day uh, there was a dawning of consciousness that came upon us and that we concluded in some amazing epiphany that our political views are completely and utterly right. And if that really does describe you, you should get out more, a lot more. Um, because in reality, people come to political conclusions in a far more shambling and human way. So I went canvassing during the local elections in my village about five or six weeks ago. And a guy came to the door and he said, oh yes, I'm voting for your lot 
lots of people do around here and I expected them to say something terribly nice about all the hard work we do for the local community in the south uh, end of the Lake District. But he didn't. He said this. I'm voting for you because the Tories are evil, Labour can't add up and you're all right. The Tories are evil, Labour can't add up and you're all right. Now, people have spent many hundreds of thousands of pounds for market research like that. So you have heard of Worcester woman I introduce to you now, Millthorpe Mann. And that, that three-part assessment of the political menu is hardly inspirational. In fact, it's almost insultingly boring. A boring label to wear. But in this world of extremes, of populism, authoritarianism, of the left and of the right, I totally settle for boring right now. I'm infused by boring. I'm desperate for boring because boring means safe and to be serious. That is precisely why we need a centre ground because no one is free, no one can flourish or prosper if they aren't safe. Safe from the consequences of the ideological experiments of the zealous and the ultra convinced. And my evidence, well, we've got two bits of evidence for you. Exhibit A, the current Conservative Party. The Conservative and Unionist Party, to be precise. The party of the free market, of Margaret Thatcher, the author, designer and lead advocate of the European single market. That party is today risking a return to violence in Northern Ireland, indeed risking the loss of Northern Ireland um, from the United Kingdom, fueling nationalism and separatism in Scotland, risking the loss of Scotland from the United Kingdom, turning their backs on that single market, extracting ourselves from the very institution that gives Britain its unique power and influence in the world, turning our backs on the European project, which remains in the history of the world, the most successful peace project. Now that is not the party of Macmillan, Churchill and Heath. We know that, that's a given. But I want now to point out to you that many conservative rationalists accept the truth that it isn't even the party of Margaret Thatcher anymore. No matter how much you may dress up Margaret Thatcher's legacy, she was a free marketeer, a unionist, a patriot, a European and a pragmatic internationalist. Today's Conservative Party is, in practice, absolutely none of those things. If you are a true Thatcherite today, then you are way to the left of the Conservative mainstream. That's Exhibit A. Exhibit B. Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> First off, I really like Jeremy Corbyn. I even admire him. Um, now, I know him, even, you might even say I, I know him fairly well, because during the Blair years, he was always in our lobby, he was never in Labour's. And I, 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 what I admire most about Jeremy Corbyn is that he has amazingly managed to unite all the trots. Now, and if you know anything about the far left in British politics, if you know anything about the far left in British politics, you will know that they are comprised of about 73 different factions, all of whom hate the Tories less than they hate each other. <laughs> and, and, and so Jezza has pulled off something of a miracle there, credit where it's due. Now, I, I respect people with strong ideologies, even if they worry me. But Jeremy is a socialist, not a social democrat. He takes the basically Marxist position that society is easily analysable in a scientific way, easily recast and reordered in a scientific way. Now, maybe he is right. Empirical evidence suggests otherwise. Now, Labour outperformed expectations in June last year. But despite Theresa May pretty much throwing the election away, they still lost. And Labour in its current form is clearly, I would argue, the Conservatives' best hope of winning again. You see, love him or not, Jeremy Corbyn is divisive. There aren't many people who, like me, both disagree with him and like him. You either love him or you hate him. There is certainly no centre ground where Jeremy Corbyn is concerned. And that matters. You see, in 1997, Liberal Democrats didn't just win Oxford West and Abingdon. We won Newbury. Newbury. Now, we'd won it in a by-election in 1993, but we held it in a general election with a majority of 10,000 in 97. And, and, and moderate Conservative voters in Newbury, uh, and many seats like it around the country, will have been sent 
direct mail, I saw some of it, direct mail um, to those people who are you know, wavering uh, whether they might vote Liberal Democrat. And one piece of direct target mail I remember seeing said, vote Lib Dem and you'll end up with Tony Blair in number 10. The reaction of those voters was to shrug and say, that doesn't sound too bad. That doesn't sound too bad. Now contrast that to 2015, when even the nice, cuddly Ed Miliband was presented as sufficiently worrying for millions of voters to back the Conservatives in marginal seats, even though many of them had no love for the Tories at all. The problem we have, if we want to see a non-Conservative government at the next election, is that the current Labour leadership frightens the horses. It creates a narrative that allows the Conservatives to avoid taking responsibility for their own record and simply run a campaign that succeeds in persuading the voter to vote against their nightmares and not for their dreams. And let none of us be so naive as to assume that the ruthless and extraordinarily well-funded Conservative Party will make the same crass errors as they did in 2017. They won't. The hard truth is that we will only beat the Conservatives by being cleverer than them, not by being wide-eyed and hopeful. The Conservatives themselves give us plenty of reasons to aspire to their being a well-developed centre ground to challenge them. Brexit is not the be-all and end-all, but it is, in my view, a Trojan horse for those who now control the Conservative Party. Britain is now on a trajectory towards small government partly because the government's own figures show that leaving the EU will cost the Exchequer around £120 billion a year, and partly because the Conservatives, or those in leadership positions, have made the ideological choice to shrink the state. For instance, we hear plenty of fanfare about new investment in mental health, but the reality is that most mental health trusts throughout England will be making 4 to 5%, 4 or 5% cuts every single year for the, foreseeable, for the foreseeable future. The overwhelming majority of schools in England uh, are laying off teaching staff and teaching assistants. Our police force is shrinking in every part of the country every year. Our armed forces are smaller now than they have ever been in modern times. Child poverty is at an all-time high, and yet the services available to support families is at an all-time low. Local government has seen a 40% cut in its funding in the last few years, with all the knock-on effects on education, social care, social work and child protection that that brings. The British state is getting smaller, all in the name of the dogmatic, right-wing, nationalist conservatism that now rules the roost. Now, that right-wing faction that now con controls the Conservative Party in its grip does not give itself a name as such, like Momentum does. It isn't a mass membership outfit like Momentum is, but it's far more effective. It is insidious, and thousands of loyal Conservatives across the country know it and have voted with their feet and left. As a result, the party that looks likely to run Britain for the next decade or more has lost countless members. The ludicrous reality is that the party that is making the British state smaller is itself smaller than it has ever been. The Conservative Party's membership is now around a fifth smaller than that of the Liberal Democrats. In part, this is because of the very attractive gentleman who led the party between 2015 and 2017, who doubled the party's membership, but I digress. Many, many who would have counted themselves on the right of the Conservative Party in the 80s and 90s have now left that party because it's become too right-wing, too ideological and insufficiently interested in those historic Tory ideals of service and good government. So many good people without a good political home. But I'd argue the poison in our political culture, indeed in our national life, is identity politics. So this is who I am. You must accept me on my terms at all times or else you have committed violence against me and though and you whose identity is different are committing an act of violence against me for being different or for holding a different world view now i i challenge you and myself over the next 24 hours to take a moment in quiet to ponder the extent that that might actually describe you identity politics is insidious 
irrational and leads to decisions that fracture us as a community and which threaten to rob us of our liberties. But being concerned about identity politics doesn't do any good unless you are keen to understand the other and do your bit to act and think differently. Because identity politics is, because identity politics is emotional, we run the risk of asking the wrong questions. I got asked someone uh, last week, what do we need to say to leave voters to switch them to remain? My, my blunt answer is that for most people, that is a staggeringly naive question to ask. Asking a leave voter, what would it take for you to switch to remain, or indeed to ask a remain voter what it would take for you to switch to support Brexit, is the equivalent of going on the doorstep of a striking Welsh miner in 1983 and asking what will it take for you to vote Conservative? Or going to a Manchester City fan and saying what would it take for you to go and support Manchester United? Identity politics is about symbolism amongst other things. I was with the parents of a friend of mine um, on one of the Scottish islands just a few months ago. They are over 80, they are farmed there for 60 years. In a quiet moment, over lunch, my friend's mum looked over uh, through the window across the moor to the neighbouring farm that had a saltire flying from its tower and she sighed and she said, that's what I hate the most. They've stolen our flag. They've stolen our flag. You can't be Scottish unless you are a nationalist. You can't be intelligent or decent unless you voted Remain. You must not love your country because you failed to say something saccharine about Meghan and Harry. A, a real centre ground is therefore about much more than ideology and policy or economics. It's about attitude, tone and conduct. It's about how we think about one another, speak to one another, act toward one another, listen to one another. Telling one side to suck it up and stop whining or the other that they are bigots isn't just unpleasant, it is extremely foolish. It's counterproductive. And I'm a liberal and I'm a keen observer of US politics. I was an Obama fan. I would have enthusiastically voted for Hillary. And I'm pretty horrified by President Trump. But Donald Trump is a lesson to us about what happens when liberals get sucked into identity politics. The problem was not specifically that liberals or what liberals believed or stood for, it was attitudinal, that liberals acted as though they'd won the argument when they hadn't and they treated with contempt anyone who spoke out of turn. The backlash was inevitable. And I'd argue that the Brexit vote had something of that in it too. You see, every empire sows the seeds of its own opposition and overthrow through overreach, arrogance and complacency. Now, this does not mean that we all have to agree with each other and have a soggy mush in the middle. No, in fact, the desire to assimilate people into one single set of cultural norms is utterly illiberal, not to mention incredibly dull. But ironically, it's the very thing that so many so-called liberals have tried to do. John Stuart Mill would tick them off and gently tell them there might be liberals in name only. His contention was that the great threat to freedom was the tyranny of opinion that by social pressure, people who hold certain worldviews are frozen out and isolated. The law doesn't stop you thinking or believing certain things, but in reality, you aren't allowed to think or believe them. Real tolerance and diversity involves fighting for the rights and freedoms of people you don't identify or agree with. Simply fighting for your own rights does not make you a liberal. Put short, calling people gammon or snowflakes is idiotic. So the centre ground is about being reasonable in our politics, our economics, our tone of debate, and it's also about being reasonable in terms of political realities. So the Tories are marginally ahead in the polls right now. Even the most loyal Tory supporter probably has to admit that this is somewhat surprising. This is a government doing something that half the country didn't want and doing it in a way that about half of those who did want it don't like. It is leaking cabinet members like a faulty bucket. It is split down the middle, riven by gaffes. It appears almost comically incompetent. It is overseeing the worst economic situation in years. People's real incomes are down, prices are up, public services are now visibly 
falling apart. It's poorly lit, poorly led, badly split, on the wrong side of nearly everything, and it's still just about winning. You see, Labour did better than expected last year. But when all said and done, they came second, and they're still second, despite the fact that their main opposition is rubbish. When you are making Theresa May look good by comparison, you are letting the side down. <laughs> a, government, a government that could give, or a movement that could give this awful government the drubbing or even the run for its money that it deserves needs not to be a myth. It needs to be real. So does this mean a new party? Well, maybe. Tribalism probably stops Liberal Tories and Social Democrats in Labour just joining the Liberal Democrats. And of course, tribalism might also stop people like me joining a new party. So to those who are seeking to set up a new party, let me give you some advice. The first thing you need to do and to work out is what will your relationship be with the Liberal Democrats? The Liberal Democrats have 2,000 councillors, 100,000 members, parliamentarians throughout Britain, a heritage going back 150 years, and they have the organisational capacity and expertise to actually win elections on the ground from the perilous position of being a third party. Those who seek to set up a new party have none of those things at the moment. If they want to survive even six months, they will need to work with the Liberal Democrats. And personally, if a new party is what they want, then I will be excited to work with them. The problem for the centre ground is that beyond the Liberal Democrats, all we hear is impressive individuals and no grass roots. British politics today seems to be awash with generals without armies. On the charges, one of the charges made by the Labour moderates against momentum is that it's no good enough, or it's just not good enough to simply do and believe things that make you feel good, you need to win elections so that you can do some good. But this argument works back at the moderates too. Unless a new movement can win electoral scraps in every council and in more than 100 parliamentary constituencies, then it will simply, ironically, become an, a carbon copy of UKIP. Lots of bluster, good poll ratings, no bums on seats in Parliament. So we are a month off the World Cup. I have just invested in my figurine Panini album. Uh, I don't expect England to do that well this time. I'm looking forward to maybe being pleasantly surprised. 22 years ago, I did expect England to do well. Most of us who were alive then did, because it was the European Championships in England. We battered Holland 4-1 and beaten Spain on penalties to get to the semi-final, where we played Germany and we were the better side, and we lost on penalties. And after the game, John Motson interviewed the crestfallen England manager, Terry Venables, and asked him somewhat insensitively, so Terry, what do you most admire about the Germans? Venables replies, their results, their results. And by that measure, I admire Tony Blair. <laughs> he beat the Tories, not once, not twice, three times. He did so by drawing together a coalition that cut across normal party allegiances and by presenting a politics that was hopeful, competent and broadly progressive. He did some really terrible things. Yes, he missed some really good opportunities. For all that, much was achieved. After a quarter of a century of decay, the NHS was essentially saved by Tony Blair's investment. Similar boasts were, or boosts were felt across schools, the police service and much of the rest of the public sector. You cannot do those things if you do not win. A movement of the centre ground needs to show Macron-esque ambition, practical calculated ambition. Winning must be our first and last thought in everything that we do. So, a political victory for the centre ground is not a myth. It is not planet Vulcan. It may be a little bit more like planet Mars in that it definitely exists but it's flipping difficult to get to. And to do so will require putting aside our labels and prejudices and putting our country before our tribes. Because I want a government 
that understands the free market is only free if it's refereed, and that to keep us safe and prosperous, we must be internationalist, that knows that small governments equal weak, weak citizens, and ensures that the state works for the people, not the people for the state, a government that is both competent and compassionate. And I want a movement that is wily, mature, and realistic enough to actually win. So this vision actually happens. It is a difficult journey to a movement at the centre ground, but it is no myth. The question is, can we bury our pride and our tribalism, even our own personal ambition, in a common endeavour to reach it? I'm up for it, if you are. Thank you. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you You're for welcome fascinating, again. fascinating speech. I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, before moving on to questions from the audience. Right. So my first question is, um, do you think Vince Cable is being hindered by the party's commitment to hold a second in-out uh, referendum, uh, considering the results from last year's election? So uh, I don't want to be totally pedantic. We don't want a second referendum. We want a, a people's vote on the final deal, none of which, um, none of us here know what the content of that is. Neither is the Prime Minister, neither is Barnier, and it seems to me only right that what started with democracy uh, nearly two years ago should not end in a stitch-up. Uh, I think uh, the reason I feel we're right to call for a referendum on the deal, um, I blame only one person, that is David Cameron. Um, he went out and set out on the um, uh, escapade of having a referendum in order to try and unite, unite uh, the two wings of his party, and that's obviously going really well, um, and, um, uh, and not in the national interest. There was no preparation or expectation they would lose the referendum, therefore they did not think what would happen next. Therefore, it is nobody's fault, save for his, um, that we will need democracy uh, to finish the loop. Um, do I think it's likely that it'll happen? I mean, the next three or four months will be critical. Do I think it hinders us? Um, let me put it bluntly, when I became leader of the party, uh, us being, uh, I mean, I, I, the Times wrote a piece the day after I was elected leader saying the party that began with Gladstone will now and end with Farron. So that was proper cheerful. And, um, but it also gave you a sense of the existential threat we were under. You need to, you can't afford nuance when you're on eight MPs and 7%. Um, and so we chose to be Marmitish. Um, and yes, uh, it winds some people up. But irrelevance is our, was our biggest challenge, not winding some people up. Um, so prior to 2010, young people formed a core voting group of the Liberal Democrats uh, following the coalition that support uh, collapse. And it's clear that recent attempts to win them back uh, based on pro-EU policy have not worked. How can the Lib Dems uh, win back young voters, or is this a lost cause for the foreseeable future? So I think, first of all, you be really careful not to be colossally patronising and set out to win a group of voters. You have to be true to yourself and stand for what you, you believe. It's very interesting, though. I mean, I think that um, undoubtedly the Liberal Democrats' um, failure to carry out the promise to scrap tuition fees and do the opposite uh, don't, uh, who was surprised that that ended up with the result that it, it did. Whatever one thinks about the system, my view is that integrity is utterly critical in politics. So I'd made a promise and therefore I voted against the line and voted against the increase in tuition fees. And that was really, really important, but that, isn't gonna, that didn't change that, that shift, that kind of disillusionment. I think the problem as well, Mark Twain once said, um, nothing so disillusions the voter than backing the winning candidate. Um, and, and the danger is the Liberal Democrats, for all of our you know, um, stated and sincere desire to set out a programme for government to be an alternative to the other two parties, to many people who, we'd, who had voted for us, we were, they voted for us because we didn't win. They might not have admitted it to themselves, but that is kind of what happened. People would vote for us as a protest against the system. And, and so the anti-system party gets elected, and it wasn't just young people who found that jarring, shall we say. So yeah, I mean, I think that our biggest threat today as a party, which I think we're getting through, was the colossal defeat in 2015. Um, so you can be right about everything, but if you're not big enough to seem important, that's a real, a real challenge. Um, as a follow-up question on tuition fees, uh, following recent Conservative <coughs> announcements, the Liberal Democrats are now the only major UK party with a policy to keep tuition fees <laughs> at their current levels. Uh, so your party received much criticism for the U-turn in 2012. Uh, so how do you justify being the only party now with such a platform? That's a great question. I mean, I think, first of all, what the so if you were to say anything positive about the current fee system compared to the one it replaced, it is that it more accurately looks like a, a graduate tax. 
Um, and actually, you've got to be earning £75,000 a year as a graduate under the new system um, before you start paying any more than you would on the previous system. So it is more redistributive. The thing is, though, and what I find objectionable about fees, so you probably get a clue about what I think about our policy should be, is that if it looks like debt and it sounds like debt and it feels like debt, even if it's not debt, it might as well be. And it has an impact on people from poorer backgrounds, uh, potentially, um, and particularly people from, you know, uh, should we say cultural groupings for whom debt is anathema, um, and mature students. I think that, uh, and it also has an impact in compounding and normalising debt. If you've got a 30 grand student debt, what's another 10 grand on your credit card? I think it's had an impact on, uh, on those sort of problems as well. So my view is that uh, it would be good if we didn't have fees at all. Um, certainly we should return to a system of main maintenance awards. I think that's been the biggest problem. Um, and if we have to pay for tuition, I think it should be done by some kind of far more uh, clear and transparent graduate tax. So my final question before we open up to the audience. Um, in 2016, you opposed Theresa May's policy of introducing new grammar schools, describing the Lib Dems as the party of education. Um, in a recent tweet, we, you reaffirmed this, stating that, quote, grammar schools do not promote social mobility, end quote. Uh, what well, then is your opinion of private schools? As surely they are a bigger problem for social mobility. Yeah, they don't receive an awful lot of public funding, though. And I think the, so I think the point is, part, part of being a liberal uh, is, uh, is understanding that you work within the realities that you set. Um, but there's no doubt whatsoever that uh, grammar schools, but especially private schools, do, do reinforce divisions in society. Uh, do they all do good jobs? Yeah. I'm not, knocking, I'm, not, I'm not saying grammar schools are bad schools. Uh, they are good schools. Uh, the problem is that their very nature means that you're excluding 80% from being out of them. And I remember going to a, a, a private school to do an awards evening once because I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a complete killjoy. Um, and I, uh, and I, I said I'd go. And I remember hearing the, the chair of governors saying, this is the school where the leaders of the future are chosen and formed. And I thought, on what basis have we had a society where that's how we choose our leaders? I'm not prejudiced against people who've been to private school, some of my best friends, um, etc. And, and, and please don't take this as being, you know, some, uh, you know, working class lab with a chip on his shoulder. I just think that, so I'm not against them, but I think we have to, because first of all, the state doesn't fund them, and in a free society, you shouldn't ban them. But I undoubtedly think that they have an impact on solidifying inequalities. Um, and even if one has got no problem with, uh, no moral problem with inequality, what a colossal waste of talent. Um, to say that only a, uh, a fraction of people in the country, because of their parents' wealth, gets to be in that bracket. Uh, it's a complete waste of the talent of our country, even from a pragmatic point of view. Thank you. So now we'll take a few questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you. Uh, please stand up uh, before asking the question. First question, we'll go to the second row. Hello? Yeah. Um, you talked about the failure of Labour in the last general election to do as well as they should have, given how it was almost an open goal. How do you account for the failure of the Liberal Democrats to also yeah. do that well, considering both parties were in disarray? I mean, you'll go strong in the EU issue, which was an issue at the time, yet how do you account for the kind of, yeah, failure of the Liberal Democrats to take advantage of that yeah. situation? And so, and so that's a fair point. I mean, one of the great things about being a former leader is you can be part commentator. Um, and it's like all these, you know, all these, all these footballers who couldn't score goals or win titles, slagging off managers who don't do those things. And I think, uh, so it's a, fair, it's, a fair, it's a fair criticism. Um, and so how do I account for it? Two or three things. I think the, the biggest reason is the 2015 election. Uh, we got so battered um, that um, in a position by 2017, um, we, you know, we clearly found ourselves uh, yet big enough to be taken sufficiently seriously as an alternative um, uh, player in that election. I think also because, if it, because it was a seven week election um, and because the local elections took place a fortnight into it, um, it was therefore established, the narrative was established, we all believed it, I believed it, Theresa May was going to win by a minimum of 50 seats, probably 100. In which case, if everybody believed that, then if the main opposition, um, you might not have liked everything about them, but they weren't going to win, then it was kind of safe to vote for them. But I also think, you know, let's be perfectly blunt, there are loads of things I did that didn't help. Um, and I think that, you know, that un undoubtedly, you know, when you are, as I was the only Liberal leader in history, and hopefully ever, not to have even been the leader of the third party, thanks to our 2015 result. Um, and you know, if you if you if you're one of seven leaders um, on a on a, a blooming program, your chance to shine is somewhat limited. Um, and if you've got you know two minutes of 
coverage a single day. Um, and I'm not complaining about this. I observe about it, and it's self-criticism really. If um, all the media want to do is, you know, use your two minutes a day to talk about your your religious faith, then you, you know, frankly, you're you're diverting attention away from the party's message. And so um, I take responsibility for a proportion of it. But our, mostly, it was down to being hammered in 2015 and simply not being in a position to be considered in the mix. Um, as a follow-up question, do you think Vince Cable was the right choice to replace you? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think um, uh, you know, we've got some great, great talent. I mean, for a party of 12 MPs, we've got some serious talent. There are probably at least three people you could choose the next leader from, uh, none of which is me, by the way. Um, uh, and one of whom is, uh, you know, uh, one of the Oxford MPs, Leila Moran, um, and I'd say Joe Swinson and probably Ed Davey and there may be others besides. That's quite a lot of talent to have in a tiny, uh, a tiny parliamentary party. Um, but I thought, uh, no, Vince is, is, I think, the right guy um, uh, at the right time. He's got great experience. I think you know, in, a, in a time where you've got um, e extremes and you've got hysteria, um, somebody who is just palpably and obviously tangibly competent, that's a real blessing. Right. Um, next question will go to uh, the gentleman in the blue jumper. Hi, so um, in your talk you talked about boring meaning safe and how you want to be boring. But um, so just what about the people that like aren't currently safe? So do you not think that a centre ground looking to simply stabilise things doesn't in fact lead to change that actually improves the material conditions of people who have been like systemically and systematically oppressed under like previous governments? So like, do you not think that a centre ground runs the risk of being like too impotent by trying to rein in different members from the left and or like to stop them drifting from the left to the right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, again, this, this is uh, the problem in even talking about centre ground, because what on earth does it mean? I did my best to try and give some kind of a, a framework as to what um, it, it might look like. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm broadly in the centre ground. I'm a centre-left liberal. Um, but I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm not somebody who believes, I'm not a conservative. I'm not somebody who believes in enshrining current privileges, we have to do our best to redistribute. Um, my argument is that an overly dogmatic, dogmatic and scientific approach to that, which I'd argue um, you know, Jeremy Corbyn style socialism is, tends to make things worse in the end. Um, and so, uh, and I disagree with it. That doesn't mean, however, I don't respect it. Um, and it doesn't mean that I'm an apologist for keeping stuff as they are. Uh, I think the danger of um, uh, of extreme political positions, overly ideological, overly prescriptive, overly scientific um, political solutions is that they are so contrived as to obviously not work and at the same time to therefore divert the energy of those who are leaders from the better job of actually trying to redistribute wealth and opportunity and to make the society we live in fairer. It won't be perfect, but fairer. A fair question. Thank you. Um, next question will go to uh the hand all the way in the back. I was just wondering if you think that the centre ground is a relative concept, and if so, that with recent political upheavals, is it changing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so it, it is, of course it's relative. Um, and um, I think that the, uh, I mean, it's why, you know, to me, I don't principally consider myself a centrist. I think liberals are one of those creatures. To, to be a liberal <coughs> is to be rational, reasonable, not fixated by ideology to the extent that you, you, you walk off um, the, the, the centre ground of common sense and pragmatic application. But, um, but to be a liberal, as I said earlier on, is, is different to be you know, to, to a new Labour Social Democrat. Why do we talk about it now? It's because it's so obvious there's a space. In the 1980s, and people forget for all that the uh, party didn't make it a, a colossal breakthrough in terms of seats, the 1983 general election, the Liberal SDP alliance got 26% uh, of the vote. Um, and, uh, and because there was space, um, I think as Blair and Major came along, there seemed to be less space. Let's look through the Blair years, um, the space was to the left of Blair, and the Liberal Democrats occupied it. I mean, this bizarre situation around the time of the Iraq war and Ian Duncan Smith was leader of the Conservative Party, what it looked like were moving to a situation where you had a kind of centre-left Liberal Democrats, <coughs> a slightly authoritarian centrist uh, Labour Party, and then you might have the third party, which was this nationalist Conservative rump. And it looked like that until they dumped Duncan Smith. Um, so yes, the centre ground is always changing. My fear is that what we've got at the moment is two broadly speaking um, 
uh, sort of narrow, narrow ideological standpoints under Labour and the Conservatives, far more extreme and prescriptive than anything even under Margaret Thatcher and Michael Foote, and therefore the need for something else is there. Um, but my political opinions do not stretch all the way from, you know, Nicky Morgan to Chukaramuna. Uh, they are precisely something different. Um, but there's some things we've got in common. And one of the things that being in the centre ground might mean is that we're big enough to accept we've done everything right and we'll, we'll cooperate with others. Thank you. Um, next question will go to um, the lady in the purple jumper. Hi there, thank you um, for your speech. Um, I recall you saying in your speech just then that um, you don't want the next government to be a Tory government. And I agree with you on what you had to say as well about private schools. I also don't believe that level of privilege should exist. So if we want to do away with the likes of private schools, is the best way to do that not to vote Labour, especially whilst we have um, a first-past-the-post system? rather than supporting a party that kept the coalition together just a few years ago. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so a couple of things there. I mean, we'll come back to coalition in a, in a, in a moment. Um, and I think that, so this is what really frustrates me, uh, because uh, the point I made, and maybe I didn't make it that well, is that Jeremy Corbyn, rightly or wrongly, frightens the horses. Um, in other words, if, you, if we want a, a roadmap to a, a majority non-conservative government, he's the biggest block that there is. Um, because if you, I can think of loads of people who are potentially in the labour market and who voted conservative last time round. I can think of people in, you know, the dozens of Lib Dem conservative marginals there are who will lean towards the Liberal Democrats and be terrified back into the Tory fold because of Jeremy Corbyn, but wouldn't be by another leader potentially. And and that's the worry I've got that the the pursuit of. Um, uh, the, the specifics of ideological position of Jeremy Corbyn and all that goes with it um, means that it's more likely we get a Tory government. Now, I, I immediately take on the chin the fact, well, you lot got 7% and got 12 MPs. So I appreciate at this particular moment we're not, we're not the answer, um, or at least we're not on our own. And there's loads of things, uh, because we live with the benefit of hindsight, we look at the new Labour government and think, you know, Iraq was awful. I, 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 detention without trial was awful. Bluntly, having a majority of 140 and doing so flipping little was awful. Having the opportunity to genuinely transform our country and have an electoral system that would allow you to vote Green, Liberal Democrat, Corbyn or whatever, by the way, those things, he missed the opportunity to do those, do those things. However, um, without a doubt, those 13 years brought more good than harm and certainly brought more good than a Conservative government. And, and my desire is for there to be a non-conservative government, and I don't see it happening um, whilst Jeremy Corbyn leads the Labour Party. On coalition, um, I mean, I, I, I take the view it was uh, an act of collective Liberal Democrat self-harm done in the national interest. Um, and it was always obviously going to do the damage that it did. But given the alternative was either go into coalition with them and stop them doing all the stuff they've done the last three years, um, or let them go to the country again in September and give them a majority of their own. Of course we made the right decision. There are some who say, why don't you do a deal with Labour, which just um, <laughs> belies uh, the fact that there was just the arithmetic wasn't there. Lib Dems plus Labour was 11 seats short of a majority. There were nine nationalists, by the way, and the Labour team we went and spoke to said, well, I guess we'll talk to you, but we're not touching the nationalists with a barge pole, in which case you are dependent upon getting your budget through Ed Balls and, and Vince Cable would have depended upon Jeremy Corbyn, Diane Abbott and, and MacDonald uh, to vote through the budget every single time, as if. Um, so the only alternative we had to letting the Tories win with the majority was to go with coalition and the country was spared for five years. I think that was national service at great personal cost. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question will go to um, the second row. Um, so you said just now that um, it was obvious that after the uh, coalition, the Liberal Democrats' support would suffer. Um, given that if it was obvious sort of back then, obviously it's easy to say now, um, and you knew how the electoral system works, do you think it was a grave tactical error for the Lib Dems to settle only on a referendum for voting reform ah, rather yeah. than pushing for voting reform itself? I mean, bluntly, yes. And I argued that AV is such a tiny chain. They should have just given it as without a referendum. Uh, and... Um, so I think that, uh, I mean, Tory central office 
expected the 2015, literally on the eve of poll, expected the Lib Dems to come in with 18. Even I, arch um, realist, expected 14, not eight. <laughs> um, uh, so I think we all thought this would be a hit for us. Um, it would be difficult for us. Um, and, and so I think that, I mean, there's an argument, who said it, I can't remember who said it, but uh, it is once said that the definition of a liberal is one who is so reasonable they won't take their own side in an argument. And I think that we, we fought a great fight on the stuff that was good for the country in the referendum, the stuff that we blocked on inheritance tax cuts, on making sure that benefits went up by 5% in that first year and, were, uh, and went up every year after that. All those other things that we managed to protect, um, we did next to nothing to protect ourselves. Um, should we have done that? I mean, arguably that's not what politics is about. The other argument is that, you know, we could have, the one other thing we could have done back in 2010 was to do something that the DUP have done and have a supply and confidence deal. But I think all the evidence is that that gives you all of the responsibility with no, none of the power or little of the power. So I think, you know, we, we got in 2010 that, that the, the greatest example of being careful what you wish for. Um, and being in a position where um, uh, potentially we were, we, we, our choices were all pretty awful. And I think in terms of policy, we handled it well. In politics, not so well. Thank you. Um, next question, we will go to the hand just over there in the black shirt. Um, so given your experiences in the last election, do you think devout religion can be reconciled with a liberal society? And can a liberal society reconcile itself to devout religion? That's a grand question. I mean, first of all, I, I think um, one thing that I find uh, worrying is that my experience would be seen as um, a sign that somehow Christians are under any level of persecution. I want to be really clear here um, that most of what didn't go right for me was down to my own lack of wisdom as it was anything else. I think that, uh, for what it's worth from a Christian perspective, um, going around claiming to be victims is a really bad look, and we're not told to do that. We're told to take it on the chin and serve hard and work hard. Um, and, and secondly, I mean, look, I mean, there are plenty of um, people who are uh, committed to their faith in the House of Commons now, uh, including, you know, people who are in, in leadership positions. Um, and uh, there is, a, I think, the peculiar observation I would make is that in the United States, you've kind of got to invent a faith in order to be taken seriously for elected office. And in the UK, you've got to pretend you haven't got one. And in both cases, it's ridiculous. Um, I think, you know, politics should be open to those of all faiths and none. Thank you. Um, next question, we'll go to the person just next to them, wearing glasses, yeah. Um, so in keeping with the theme of the last question, when you resigned in July 2017, you said that you had found it impossible to hold a faithful view of scripture and to be a political leader at the same time. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on the implication that the only way to be a faithful Christian is to hold a non-affirming view of homosexuality um, and really, as a, as a secondary point, by resigning, didn't you sort of make the point that the only way to be a Christian in politics is to hold these dogmatic views? And isn't that an inherently illiberal position? I mean, I think that to be a liberal is to not enforce dogma on others. Uh, and um, so if we say, uh, so for instance, I think the issue of, uh, of the day and how we construct our society um, is that the assumption is that uh, there's an absence of faith um, and that's the neutral position and the holding of faith is a tolerable quirk um, and maybe if you if your faith is more than just cultural but you actually seek to live by it then maybe it's not even that maybe it's an intolerable quirk and I think I just argue in a liberal society that doesn't make any sense um, Atheism, secularism, humanism are important worldviews and we should fight to make sure uh, their vo those voices are heard. To treat them as the state religion is no less mad than treating the Church of England as a state religion. Um, and, and, to, uh, and so no, to my, to my view, I mean, f fundamentally as I said earlier on, there are plenty of ways in which I could have handled you know, the whole process 
uh, more wisely. I just took the view that given where I'd found uh, myself, I had kind of three choices. Uh, option one, um, to basically compromise my faith and, and uh, on, money, on many issues, no doubt. And secondly, or secondly, to be a really poor leader who is sucking up all the oxygen the party should be getting in, in all that nonsense. And then uh, the third option was just to step back. And I think that was the right thing for me, for the party. Um, but you know, a wiser person than me would have handled it differently. Thank you. Um, next question, we will go to um, the, yeah, the hand just there. Um, I was just wondering um, why you thought France had voted for the centre and moderation and not the US or the UK. Is, it any, is there anything we can learn from Macron or um, maybe is it their electoral system or the discourse? Better looking leaders, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and a number of things, really. I mean, so um, let's not forget, you perhaps know better than me the exact percentage, uh, but Macron en marche only got about uh, got 20, 21% in the first round. And then because the other parties were, were weak, he was in a runoff, <laughs> runoff against the Nazi. I reckon I'd beat a Nazi. Um, I reckon most of us would manage that. So I, I'm, I'm a fan of Macron, but we shouldn't, you know, in, in dying with, with uh, you know, t too much of the kind of magic dust. I think he's a very, very capable guy. Uh, his team were very closely, heavily coached by the Canadian Liberals, um, uh, who had come from third place to first place, with a not dissimilar kind of economic and socially liberal um, kind of approach to um, uh, to, to things. Um, so I mean, Macron had uh, some help because of the electoral system, but he also had a very clear programme and a message, um, and there was a clear need, and there was a gap there. Um, you know, he was he was aided by. Uh, a socialist party that was seen to be past its sell-by day, a conservative party that had in all sorts of um, uh, difficulties, and someone had to, you know, go alongside uh, Marine Le Pen, and it was him, and so of course he won. So um, it, he's, he's very talented, a clever, well put together movement, um, which I think is a lesson for us here: the electoral system and a bit of luck. But you always need a bit of luck. Thank you. Um, next question will go to. Um, the gentleman just just behind, yep. Cheers. Um, thanks very much. So, so you mentioned that uh, the hostile environment and problems with the attitude towards immigration actually hasn't started with the Tories, started under Labour, uh, and um, with all its ramifications. To, to what extent do you think a centre ground could reclaim the debate around immigration, can change the tone around it, uh, especially in the light of Windrush, but also uh, treatment of EU27 citizens? So I think Windrush um, uh, is, could, could well be a kind of watershed moment. And I, for all that it's tragic and, and heartbreaking, it actually might be really important. It's interesting, for the first time, I've seen tabloid conservative supporting newspapers um, uh, talking about immigration in positive ways and in patriotic tones. So this could be, a, this could be an important moment. I also think the experience of Brexit will remind people that um, uh, that immigration is there for a reason. <laughs> uh, I mean, you just go to my patch. You go down to so the Windermere, the Lake District. You know, the most uh, second most popular tourist destination in the UK after London, um, and every other business in downtown Bowness Bay uh, is looking for staff um, because what Brexit has persuaded uh, the lowest paid EU staff to clear off. Um, those in more professional and skilled positions tend to be hanging on more than not, more often than not. So that the loss of what it means for our society, I think, will be felt. So I've got to hope that's the case um, and make no assumptions. The other thing is just worth bearing in mind. I mean, so I, I say I admire Blair for his results. It's important to pick under the surface. There's lots of stuff that was wrong in opposition. And a large amount of Blair positioning on ground to push the Tories into the right was taking really authoritarian positions on issues, not just on migration, but on street homelessness um, and things like that. So please don't think that I'm an apologist for, for Blair or, or um, that the only route to an electable centre is by ha be having, to, having to, you know, ape the Tories in certain ways. Thank you. We have time for two or three more questions. Um, so we'll go to the hand all the way in the back. Thank you for your speech. Um, following on from the questions over there, do you think there's 
do you think that no matter how abhorrent a pol politician's personal, moral or religious views might be, voters should put that to one side so long as they don't seek to impose it onto their, po their specific politics? Okay, so we'll... Uh, well, well the, the abhorrence is an interesting one. But I think, um, so, so f f first of all, uh, I mean, I, m my sense, um, you know, without going into much detail of all this, so I joined the Liberals when I was 16, became a Christian when I was 18, um, and it occurred to me really early on um, that my job is not to impose um, my morality, morality on other people, it is to fight for other people's rights to make their own choices. That is what makes a real liberal. As I said in my speech, if you only defend people uh, with whom uh, you identify and agree, you're not a liberal. Anybody, any of us can do that. You're only a liberal and a true uh, champion of diversity when you fight for worldviews that are different to your own. Um, and so, uh, but no, I think, you know, people's individual personal character is actually part of the mix when you're voting for people. So if you find a person abhorrent, don't vote for them. Thank you. Um, next question. We will go to um, the hand just there. Yep. Um, given that you said the Brexit vote um, became a Trojan horse for identity politics, would you agree that Remainers have been equally guilty of navel-gazing about the state of the UK rather than painting an idealistic picture of the EU that we could potentially rejoin? Yeah, definitely, is a short answer. Um, I think the Remainers are at least as guilty of identity politics um, as the Brexiteers, um, and, uh, and a failure to understand that other side uh, a deliberate failure to understand the other side, um, I think, is is a is a, is, is also utterly utterly corrosive. Uh, and I think that I mean the tricky thing for people like me was so um, frustrating to be in. We only really came to prominence as a party over Brexit after it happened um, by being the only ones who you know banged on about it still. Um, and but during the campaign, it was so frustrating because you'd have some people who were just unashamed apologists for everything the EU did. And then you got the whole Osborne transactional kind of, you know, uh, project for your kind of, kind of stuff. Um, and, and neither of them were effective messages. To me, my, my Europeanism, my support for us being in the European Union was despite its faults um, and, uh, and its potential centralisation and, uh, and, and, and waste and some of the things that I think, you know, the CAP, for example, which contains all sorts of stuff that we should not want to uh, have signed up to. Um, uh, in the end, um, my, my pro-Europeanism is, is, is emotional um, and, and, and experiential. If you think that, you know, what, in 1984, um, it so happened to be that year, I remember going up Fishergate High Street in Preston, where I was born uh, and brought up. And Preston's not a wealthy place, and it definitely wasn't in 1984. But as I went up that hill, Fishergate Hill, the laundrette, three blocks from the railway station, was not a laundrette anymore. It was a nuclear fallout shelter showroom. And I knew no bugger in Preston had any money. If people were buying nuclear fallout shelters, uh, I'm pretty confident that meant it was about to flipping kick off. And, you know, living, I didn't live through the billets, I didn't live through a real war, but, you know, growing up under the Cold War and the shadow of the bomb, uh, and then you realise, years later, that 11 of the countries in the Warsaw Pact are now in the European Union, and six countries, who in 1984 had nuclear weapons on their soil, pointed right here, are now sat round the table, arguing the toss about fish with us instead. That's progress. If that was the only reason being in the EU, that would have done for me. And the lack of an emotional case that resonated and the obsession with a, being an apologist and a fear monger, that's what cost remain the referendum. And we should ask ourselves more questions perhaps than we do the other side. Thank you. You have time for one final question. So we'll go to the hand just there. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to pick up on your answer to the very, very first question. Um, I wanted to ask, do you think that the Liberal Democrats are still relevant in British politics? And assuming that you think they are, what, aside <laughs> from uh, their position on Brexit and campaigning for um, a, a people's vote, what, aside from that, what do you see as their role in British politics? So, I mean, relevance will be a hard one. Um, I, I don't know if any of you uh, 
watched or followed the, uh, uh, the, the Jeremy Thorpe drama last night, um, and uh, which you know I'm, I'm, I know quite a lot about. Uh, and uh, it's a reminder of a time, amongst everything else, when we had to fight back from near extinction uh, once again or another time. Um, so the answer is yes, we need to be relevant. Um, we are clearly not where we were eight years ago in terms of seats and place in the national debate. Uh, put bluntly, um, I think we are the biggest beneficiaries of the collapse in UKIP. Why? Because it just clears the field. It's obvious who the third party is now. And our ability to critique the system and the other two is much clearer when our voice can actually be heard because there's not so many other people um, in, that, in that field. Um, so yes, I think ideologically we're relevant, politically we're, re we're relevant, but in terms of how we go forward, we do need to remember a phrase that I am uh, very fond of using because I believe it to be true, not least because I'm you know, not necessarily a detailed man, but I often used to say to the party when I led it, and I still say it now, the Liberal Democrats have never lost an election because our manifesto wasn't long enough. It's because our message wasn't clear. And if I was to ask all of you to go and sit down and write me a dozen words on what Labour are for, what the Tories are for, what the SNP is for, what's UKIP for, I'm reasonably confident that we get quite a lot of common ground uh, as to what those 12 words were for each of those parties. For the Liberal Democrats, I'm not quite so sure. And so banging on about Brexit in some ways rankles. But I think given that only one in four people out there actually know what our position is, maybe we're not banging on about it enough. Um, maybe the road to relevance and growth is clarity of message uh, and uh, being uh, accepting that you know, when you find yourself not back to where we were in 2015, okay, we made a small recovery in 2017, um, the route back is by relevance. When you are a party with 12 MPs, nuance is a dirty word. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but please join me in thanking Tim Farron for joining us today.